All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Heidi Weigleitner, and I am a member of the Progressive Dane Steering Committee and involved with um, the Policy Committee as well. Actually, I guess chair that committee. Um, I'm also on the Dane County Board and represent District 2. Um, tonight, it's my turn to chair the Progressive Dane General Membership Meeting, and we're having a, a special meeting today in, um, in collaboration with the Safe Skies and Clean Water <coughs> Coalition. Um, so I'm really excited to, um, in a minute here, introduce our panel. Um, just a couple housekeeping items at the beginning. You should have seen, there would have been a sign-in sheet, I think, at the back. And the coalition may have also, and I'm not sure Progressive Dean had some literature at the back. Um, I also have been asked to make a brief announcement about an important event tomorrow night. Um, that Tom Boswell is um, involved in, and that is a dessert and conversation with Kathy, Kathy Kelly of Voices for Creative Nonviolence and the launch of a new fundraising campaign for the latest Maya Clean Water Filter Project. That's tomorrow night um, from 7 to 9, Thursday, July 25th, at James Reed um, Unitarian Universalist Congregation um, off of uh, East Johnson and 4th Street. Um, so Kathy Kelly and Kit Kitridge of the Freedom <coughs> Flotilla will talk about the history and future plans of the Flotilla and also about Kathy's recent trip to Iran with Code Pink. Refreshments and desserts including baklava will be served. Palestinian crafts and olive oil will be offered for sale. The event is free but donations will be gladly accepted as they launch this new project to provide clean water to students at two Rafa schools. For more info, go to madisonrafa.org or find it on Facebook. Um, thanks, Tom, for bringing that to our attention. Okay, so um, I've already introduced myself. Um, and via Skype, we're very excited to have Roseanne Greco with us. Um, Roseanne is a retired Air Force Colonel. She was on the South Burlington City Council for several years and also served as president of the council. Um, she has a long and distinguished um, career in the military and is involved in many community groups. Um, she's an expert on F-35s in the basing process and we're gonna hear more about that in detail in a few minutes. Um, and she's led the effort in Burlington to oppose the basing of F-35s at the Burlington International Airport. So welcome, Roseanne. We're so grateful for you to share your time and expertise with us tonight. My pleasure. Um, then to my left is John Peck. John is a neighbor of mine, <laughs> um, as well as uh, uh, the executive director of Family Farm Defenders. Um, he is an economics instructor at Madison College, oh. and he is also on the board of Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice. Um, John is a, a renowned and impressive activist and organizer and professor. We're grateful. He's going to um, address some of the issues of concern to farmers and people in rural Wisconsin, as well as some of the um, economic um, development opportunities or missed opportunities by pursuing militarism. Um, then is Tom Boswell. Tom Boswell is a community organizer and journalist and an award-winning poet. Um, Tom has worked on a lot of different issues um, and is an organizer with the Safe Skies Clean Water Coalition. Um, he's here tonight and will be um, addressing, um, you know, particularly of concern, the, the PFAS that has contaminated um, groundwater in Dane County and is of serious concern in the state and nation. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for being here. Um, and then last to the left um, of every, or my left, is Alder Tag Evers, um, Evers, I'm sorry, <laughs> not to be confused with the governor, um, Tag Evers, he represents District 13 on the uh, Madison Common Council, was elected with the Progressive Dean endorsement this April. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Tag with us here um, representing another uh, branch of local government at the City Council and he's going to talk about some of the things we might be able to brainstorm um, to express our positions on these important issues. Um, so I did, um, there should be sheets of paper um, around if you have 
questions while I'm um, asking questions or while people are answering those questions, write them down. Martha can collect them and bring them to me. I don't want anyone to forget anything. Um, and also, we should have some time, I think, for a discussion at the end. I have a, you know, a couple of questions for each panelist, but we should be able to open it up for the, a broader um, discussion as well. Um, so first, I'm going to um, ask Tom to give us a little bit of background about um, the organizing of the Safe Skies and Clean Water Coalition. Tom, can you tell us um, why this coalition formed and, and the need to connect the issues of F-35s as well and um, clean water? Okay. Um, didn't have, uh, it's going to be kind of jumbled because I didn't have time to really uh, work on, on my notes. But um, I got involved, uh, well, I've been a peace activist most of my life. And uh, last year I had started to do... Uh, a blog that was uh, is basically book size uh, on issues of war and peace. That was last uh, last spring, and uh, about the same time in March, um, I went to what they call the scoping session or an open house that the Air National Guard had. Uh, this was actually the beginning, the initiation of the environmental impact statement process that they're mandated through the federal government to do under the National Environmental Policy Act. And um, that was also, I just found out the other day, about the same time that Progressive Thane got involved in the issue. And they had a meeting back in early March, this is 2018, and <coughs> unanimously uh, decided to oppose uh, the siting of the F-35s at Turax. Um, the, when I went to this open house, and there was also some people, some of them in the room here, who picketed out, outside of the presentations that the Air National Guard was doing that day in, in March. And uh, Maria Powell was there, and I was just reading one of her early blogs lately, and it was almost kind of humorous because they had a video showing throughout the, the day and her and one of her neighbors were there watching this video about the F-35 and all the different uh, bombing capabilities and whatnot of the plane and a neighbor turned to her and said, hey, you know, there's no sound with this video. <laughs> And of course, uh, the most egregious part about uh, the F-16s that we have now, and what would be much worse with the F-35, is the noise that people who live around the airport are uh, subjected to on an, ongoing, on an ongoing basis. So I think if they would have turned on the volume, <laughs> well, nobody would have been able to talk to each other at least. Uh, there was also like a meeting right before that, the last day of February. I don't know what they called it, but I guess they called it a listing session. And I guess they invited uh, public officials uh, and citizens. But Maria also wrote about that, and she basically used the word double speak because uh, from the military, they basically were continually contradicting themselves when people asked questions about what type of weapons that were, were going to be uh, used there. Were they going to be air to air, air to ground? I don't know if they got into the nuclear we weapon aspect of it, but um, they basically started by saying there would be no weapons. They were going to use like concrete dummies for weapons. And then as they continued to talk and as people continued to ask questions of them, they basically turned around entirely and talk, started saying, well, we're going to have uh, air to ground and air to air, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And, you know, I guess the moral there is, you know, I don't think they could be trusted then and I don't think they could be trusted uh, now. 
so anyway, I started to talk to more more people in the in the community, um, and, and that was last year. And it wasn't really till the beginning of this year that I started to hear uh, rumors about the water uh, situation that that there were problems with water on the north and east side of town. And we had a meeting where Paula Rogi, this is a James Reed. Uh, talked about uh, uh, divesting from nuclear weapons and uh, the back to the brink campaign with which physicians with social responsibility is involved in and I think Barb and Harry here were there that night and actually did we lose her? <laughs> uh, you know mentioned the fact that there were water problems uh, in the neighborhood around Turex so we you know, I started to talk to more and more people and, and found out that there were a lot of good people already involved who were tracking the F-35 issue and people who were tracking the PFAS issue. And uh, one thing I realized, and this is probably the most important thing I have to say, is that the Air National Guard, as far as I can tell, has not been a very good neighbor haven't been a good neighbor to Madison or Dane County. They haven't been a good neighbor to all the low income and minority people who live in neighborhoods surrounding Truex. And uh, not only that, but even way before the PFAS issue, they have not been a good neighbor. There's been pollution there before the uh, Air Force was there and the Air National Guard, the Army was there and the Army National oh. Guard. So they've basically been polluting those neighborhoods since about the 1940s. Now the PFAS started to be used in the 1970s all over the country. Of course it's used in commercial ways that people know about here. but. Uh, it was used uh, in fire uh, fighting train. So, and I'll talk to, about this a little more, but virtually every military installation in the country has a problem with severe levels of water contamination and pollution and contamination of local communities around those bases. And in some places they have not been honest with the people at all about what's been happening, and I can give a couple of cases later. But uh, basically, I decided, and uh, I think other people decided, that we could get more traction on the issue of the F-35s and the possibility of nuclear weapons being uh, cited in Madison. And let me just interrupt myself here and say another way they have not been a good neighbor in the past and again, it's been Mary, Maria Powell, who's done a lot of the research on this, is that these weapons have been stored here in the past. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might be surprised to hear that, but they tracked it back a few decades at least, and for certain, for the, from the time that Paul Soglin was first selected, and it's no doubt that these weapons have been here in the past. I talked to somebody at, at James, uh, a week or so ago who was a career Air Force person and he said it's undoubtedly that nuclear weapons, they had a plane called the F-89 which I'm not even familiar with myself but it, it's undoubtable that uh, the nuclear weapons have been stored and transported from Truex Airport but the, uh, the Army and the military has a policy of not saying in either way, if there are net weapons or if they're not nuclear weapons at any installation in the country. So, but we decided that the best way to uh, approach this is to take the, the issue that's most immediate to people right now because it threatens their, their drinking water and uh, address that issue, organize it around that issue, reach out to people in the neighborhoods and other organizations, and uh, use that. And basically our demand is the Air National Guard and the Air Force should clean up the mess they've made, and the mess they've really been making since the 40s and 50s, and for sure since the 70s, 
Uh, before they talk about expanding the base, um, they want to do a fifth forty to sixty million dollar investment in the base to accommodate the F thirty fives, and so we're going to get a lot more no noise pollution, air pollution, and probably water pollution, particularly with the the remediate or the work that they're going to be doing to expand the base. So uh, our demand is basically that clean up your mess before you even talk about doing anything else to two acts their base. Thanks, Tom. Um, and while Barbara works diligently to get Roseanne back, we're gonna shake up the order a little bit. Um, and I guess I'm gonna address this one to Tag. Um, Tag, you, you know, you're a new alder on the council. Um, and I, I'm really, you know, I was excited to hear you identify this issue as one that's important to you as a, a city council person, local elected official at the Progressive Bank um, meeting a couple months ago where we talked about priorities. Can you um, explain why you care about the, these issues, um, the sighting of the F-35s and, and its impact and the Air National Guard's impact on a, our community? and? and Madison in particular? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, I am a new order, and um, I, I'll introduce, I'll inject the caveat here <laughs> that your description of this panel is that you invited experts. <laughs> I have to say, I don't really feel like an expert, but I do, um, I have committed myself to listen to my community, our communities, and to serve uh, on, on the needs and the concerns of that are dear to my heart and dear to your hearts, those of you in the room. And uh, at the uh, Progressive Day meeting, I mentioned that during the campaign, the Chamber of Commerce had a survey was out. I did not seek their endorsement, but I'll, I'll talk to anybody. I'll answer their questions. And, and I, I did answer their questions, and one of them was about the F-35s. They wanted to know what your position as a candidate uh, what your position was on the F-35s coming into Madison. And I res I responded just, you know, I quoted Eisenhower uh, on the military-industrial complex and referenced my father who fought in World War II and came out of the experience as a complete pacifist. And, um, but part of their narrative is about the $100 million annual contribution to the local economy. And to me, as an elected official, it feels like that narrative has become dominant and uh, influential and is one that um, I think strategically we have an opportunity to critique. Um, and we can critique it from a standpoint of looking at the numbers themselves and how they come up with that figure, but we can also critique it from, a, from various uh, a vantage point of just uh, conceptually and theoretically. And I have a master's in economics and I could join with John and we could break this down. But, uh, if you're, you can't look at the contribution of the economy in isolation from its costs. Uh, you look at the social costs, for example, of uh, the areas that Tom has referenced and, and PFAS. So if we want to do a critique of the economic argu argument in the chamber's narrative, one that uh, Soglin bought into, to the extent to which he gave a tepid, somewhat tepid, but nonetheless an endorsement of, of the F-35s, and one that clearly Tammy Baldwin has bought into. So we have to critique it from the concept of social costs and environmental justice. The social costs, the spillover effects of, uh, of the F-35s being present. Um, Again, we can critique what, where, how they came up with that $100 million, but we really need to focus on the cost. And so folks living in District 13 who are not impacted directly, not yet, not in any significant way on PFAS, but it's coming, begin to alarm them about, the, about environmental justice and about the impact of residents in the Truax neighborhood. Because it's, then, it, then it becomes an issue where you can't just say I'm in favor of, of, of this big entity that contributes $100 million to our economy in isolation. We would not let a corporation 
uh, and justify and say they're good here because they're employed 1,200 people or 1,600 people if they're polluting our water and the water that we drink. Well, we, you could say, yes, we do it all the time. We've done it. We've done it with, we did it with Madison Kip and we've done it. But we can bring up, we can put them in the same box. We can put the Air National Guard and the Truax base in the same back box as any criminal polluter out there, and we should. And secondly, um, the other strategy is not only just tying it to PFAS, but as Tom mentioned, tying it to the nuclear issue. And that's important because at that open house meeting, uh, from what I understand, they denied that they were going to have nuclear arms. But from what I understand, in the, in the, uh, the military has admitted that they're upgrading the F-35s, all of them across the board, to be nuclear capable. Um, and these, it'll be a selective capability ranging from 0.3 kiloton all the, kilotons all the way up to a 50 kiloton bomb, a gravity bomb. By comparison, the, the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima was 20 kilotons, mm -hmm. and the Nagasaki bomb was 15 kilotons. So we're talking about massive destructive capability, potentially housed right here in Madison. I don't believe them for a second when they say they're not going to have nuclear weapons here. But from an argument of saying that the, the, the possibility makes us a target, if you don't know, let's say, let's put it in a scenario of saying you want to be concerned about, in a city that would be known for having nuclear weapons, if you don't know, but it's possible because other, you know, which which base would have them and which wouldn't, we could still be a target in the case of some kind of nuclear standoff. So um, those are the types of concerns that I think that we need to tie it to. Tie the F-35s to the environmental justice issue. Tie the F-35s to the nuclear issue. Lastly, I will mention there is by ordinance, not just by resolution, there is an ordinance that was established in 1983 where Madison became a nuclear-free zone. And one of the, it's not, it's not the strongest ordinance, maybe there's strategically we need to think about uh, updating this ordinance, modifying it, but there is one clause that no new nuclear weapons, delivery systems for such weapons, or components expressly intended to contribute to the operation, guidance, or delivery of a nuclear weapon shall be produced within the city. So, I, you know, I, I intend to take this to the city attorney's office and to see how this reads and if we perhaps need to, we need to update this with stronger language. But this is a way of pushing back. Now, we may not succeed. We may not succeed in stopping the F-35s, but if we can tie them to the environmental justice issue and the nuclear issue, we may be able to guilt them into cleaning up the, the pollution that they've made so far. We may be able to create enough of a ruckus that we can get some action out of the federal government. Thanks, Terry. Um, Terry, you segue when you were talking about um, looking at the total cost of this um, and I wanted to, to have John follow up on that issue in terms of um, is there an economic <laughs> benefit to having the F-35s based here um, when you look at these costs and um, or are there alternatives <laughs> potentially that could be pursued that might um, not have the same cost and also um, have some benefits. Can you talk about how you see the economics surrounding this issue and um, contrast perhaps to how the chamber has presented it? Yeah, so that, that's, those are great questions. I mean, thanks for inviting me here. I'm glad Tag mentioned some of the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis. And I'll, I'll admit right off the bat that you know, I teach economics at Madison College. I get to hear these planes every day flying over my classroom, knocking chalk off the chalkboard. Um, I live in the neighborhood. So um, I also worked for the World Bank. Part of my job at the World Bank was doing cost-benefit analysis on projects where we were supposed to like 
have the scales and decide is this a good use of our money or not. And um, so yeah, we can certainly talk about in fact in preparing for this talk tonight, I was looking at the people supporting the F-35s, what they thought were the main reasons why. Um, our former governor, Scott Walker, said he was eager to hear the sound of freedom <laughs> uh, blasting through our neighborhood. So he obviously values the sound of freedom. There's a value, a positive benefit, according to our former governor. Uh, Tammy Baldwin, our senator, talked about the strategic, geographic, economic capabilities of Truax. That there's some sort of importance to her in that having that base there. Uh, our Senator Ron Johnson talked about Wisconsin's key role, and I'm quoting here from press releases and different media articles, key role in modernizing the Air Force and keeping Americans safe and secure. So there seems to be a lot of positive, you know, monetary value being subscribed to safe, safety, security, the sound of freedom. Um, and then we heard about the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce, quoting the number of $100 million in economic benefits for Madison each year. I tried to track down a little bit more of where those numbers came from. 62 million of that's payroll. So it's actually people working at Truax, getting money to work there, supposedly spending that money in the economy. Part of that was the services provided by Truax to the Dane County Airport, which they say are worth $10 million a year. This is their firefighting equipment and so on. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Oh, yeah, no, great. I'm glad we're back. Roseanne. Okay. Good, you're back. I'm going to be lost connection about 10 minutes in, so. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> Technology, all right. I'm glad you're back. Um, There's no bad You can't, like, lose them. Are you here? I can't disconnect this. Okay. I'm not sure about the sound, though. Okay, I'll, I'll. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Okay, can you hear us? I can hear you just fine. Great. Um, if it's all right, um, John, can we interrupt? Yeah, no, I John was talking about mind. economics. We changed up the order. <laughs> um, and I regret not getting to you right away because of that potential um, problem. Um, but uh, let's get back a little bit to the process of citing the F-35s. Um, this is something you know, you know well, Roseanne. You've been um, you know, dealing with this, organizing um, related to the process, um, an F-35 sighting in Burlington. Can you walk us through what that process looks like and um, kind of where, where you're at and what happened in Burlington and, and maybe how that um, parallels or compares to what we're dealing with here in Dane County? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and it's a very long, snorted story, um, so I won't go into all of the details, but um, I, I, I was taking notes, and I think as Tom was talking about uh, you know, the scoping session, the listening session, and all that, so I mean, if you want to know the actual process, just, just go to NEPA, you know, National Environmental Policy Act, and just Google them, and it'll just lay it out to you clearly what, what the federally is mandated by what they do, uh, what would they have to do. So you said your scoping session was in March of 2018? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or, yeah. Okay. Which means um, your EIS, your environmental impact statement, is uh, likely to come pretty soon. Uh, yep. Yeah, um, it was supposed to come out uh, in January or February, Roseanne, and it's yeah. just announced uh, yesterday or so, or sometime recently, that it will be out in August. So it was a delay of about three quarters of a year, and I suspect that's because of the PFAS issue, but I'm not certain. Well, uh, ours too was delayed. Uh, we had a whole series of, of delays along the way, and, and of course the F-35 is a technological disaster. So, you know, a lot of the, uh, and the program and management offices is, you know, juggling a lot of different things. So I don't know if it's the best thing. I would guess it is not, but uh, th that's just my guess. Um, uh, but, but the more delays, the better. Um, so, you know, the, what you don't, I mean, the time is, is uh, the more you can drag this out, the better. But uh, let me give you a, 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 a shorter version as I can. What I would uh, share with you based on what we did, what worked, uh, what, what didn't work, 
and uh, what we perhaps would do differently, which you could do now. So getting prepared for the um, for a massive resistance to it is probably the most important thing you can do. If you can communicate to the Air Force that you have a sizable number of people and groups perhaps, so the fact that you've got multiple groups as we did, um, helps. And they, they don't know if you have a group of five people or 500 people, right? Um, but the more that you can convince the Air Force that you have people behind you you have determination, you will not give up, and you intend to do everything within your, anything that's possible to stop the facing, the better. The Air Force, if it is given a choice between going to a location that is just, that is gonna be welcoming of the weapon system, won't be providing resistance, all things being equal, they will go to that facility. The Air Force doesn't want trouble. I mean, I mean they want to be good neighbors. Uh, I mean, uh, seriously, not maybe for altruistic reasons, but for monetary reasons. So if they look, if it looks like to them that you're going to put up a fight and maybe even take legal action, and I would really talk about legal action right now, um, that costs them a lot of money. It, it delayed ours five years, probably cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal costs. I mean, it's your taxpayer dollars, not that money's an issue. Um, but the more you can convince them that they're in for a incredible fight that will likely result in multiple lawsuits, you might be able to get them to move someplace else or come down in favor of the other bases they're considering along with you. Uh, I think that's what happened in Boise. Idaho can't be certain, but they were slated to, to, to go there and then they, they veered away. So uh, making a lot of noise. If I, whatever means you can think of, letters, postcards, social media, if you can get the press on you to decide, if you can hold, um, you know, maybe at your city councils or select boards or whatever you call them there, get your elected officials to take up the matter um, so you can discuss it openly so the press can cover it. Uh, uh, you know, anything to get the attention, uh, get the Air Force's attention. They will be following everything that happens in your community. If you have a news story, if your broadcast media or your print media come out with something, I can guarantee you they will know that. There's a whole department that follows that. And then they report off as what happened here. Uh, we know a lot about the process because uh, even though we lost our two lawsuits, one we filed against the city of uh, Burlington, uh, we, we sued them because we said they violated our environmental uh, policies in the state of Vermont. And we also sued the Air Force. Even though we lost, uh, when we sued the Air Force, the federal judge required that the Air Force release something it called the administrative record. And that's all the documentation that they uh, are, are, are actually creating now, uh, briefings, letters, uh, e mostly emails back and forth. Uh, anyway, we got, that was released, uh, hundreds of pages were redacted, but that's where we found out what they were doing. Uh, because we were able to read all that. And we read that they were briefing about what was happening, what was in the news today uh, in Burlington, Vermont area, and what was being, what was happening up there. And then sometimes we even privy to them, you know, expressing concern. So I, I'm telling you, it, it's not hypothetical that they are watching, they're paying attention, and they don't want trouble. You have to prove to them you're going to cause trouble. So uh, that's sort of a shorthand version of what to do. Now, the other thing is when the EIS comes out, because it's probably too uh, it's probably too late to stop it, it, it more than likely it's being written. So our first uh, EIS came out in three drafts, roughly 6,000 pages of documentation of, uh, in the environmental impact statement. Um, and they, they, they contract that out. So they have the best contractor writing that cost. I think we learned ours cost $5 million to produce. Right? Yes. You have to go through that. And what you might want to do, because it's such an, uh, uh, you know, it, 
it's such a heavy document, uh, not written for lay people. Parts of it are, most of it is not. What I would suggest you do, I mean, I read the whole thing, which is now I, why I'm an expert, um, but you might want to get it up. And that's what, at some point, because they kept coming out with new drafts, because we challenged them, and they had to redo it, because they had incorrect data in there. So we forced them to do it again. And so when the second batch of three volumes came out, I did it out. I said, well, you took, if you read this chapter, if you read this chapter, right? Really, at that point, we were looking to compare what was different. And, you know, when I was in the military, one of the ways, and you may have heard this before, one of the ways is to hide information from the public. It, and, well, there's two ways to do it. One is to give them nothing, and the other is to give them everything. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> so Makes when sense. you give them everything, they are banking on the fact that you're not going to read it. Right? Right? But that's where the, the evidence will be for you to challenge what they're, what they're doing. If, if I had never read that, we never would have been able to say, you're harming close to 7,000 people. You're saying the noise, because we had F-16s as well, that the noise of the F-35 is four times louder than the F-16. You're saying that federal agencies, and I think there's like eight different federal agencies, from HUD to uh, VA to the military uh, agencies, that say people that live in this kind of noise zone are in an area that's incompatible with residential use, right? Yep. Had we not read that, we never would have had the substance to challenge. Now, uh, there are things, they're going to tell you a lot in that environmental impact statement. You need to get educated very quickly as soon as that comes out, so that when the, because the public comment period will start, I think it's usually 60 days, you have to write a letter, send an email on every friggin' thing you can see in there. You don't have to, you can ask a question, what does this mean? What's the impact? Who's gonna pay for it? You know, um, what are the economic implications? What are the health implications? One of the things um, that they didn't do with us that they should have done is to, to do a, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but it's sort of a, um, a real estate assessment of what the economic costs are going to be to the area, demand that they do that. They're supposed to do it. They didn't do it for Burlington. We didn't ask them in enough time. See, you have a short window of time to raise as many things as you can, because if you ever do decide to file a lawsuit, you are not allowed to raise things in the lawsuit that you didn't already bring to the attention. You don't have to go in detail. You just say, you know, what are you know, what, what is the economic impact on, on the housing market in our area, right? I'm, I'm just giving you ideas. One of the things that they, they gave a uh, incomplete review of for us was the health impacts of, of the noise. You know, they're gonna, you're going to hear the sound of freedom in only a few minutes a day. I mean, they have these pack raises that they use every single place they intend to put the F-35. Uh, the sound of freedom is one, you're probably going to hear, uh, it's only a few minutes a day, in our case they calculated six minutes a day, you're going to hear, you know, it's good for the jobs and the economy, and you're going to hear it's essential for the mission of the Air Guard, or they're going to go away, in our case the whole airport was going to close down, I mean, just check a little sky is falling kind of stuff, uh, but they're going to say those things, so if you're prepared in advance to get out in front of that and say, this is not a job issue, nothing to do with jobs. In fact, it's a job drain uh, when you look at what military jobs cost versus environmental jobs or other kind of, of uh, you know, sustain, sustainable jobs, right? Um, or in short-term jobs or for a very small number of people. You know, my suggestion is get these arguments put together now because then you will not be on the defense. You will be on the offense. When you, when you call, when you address the issues before they had the chance, which they probably already started doing, you know, to convince, or need it for our defense. It's going to make you more vulnerable, but, you know, and I can help you with some of that as the time goes on. But the health impacts are one of the things that I think, um, I wish we had, uh, uh, well, been able to get uh, elevated. When they came out, so noise is unwanted sound. I learned that in the 
I learned a whole lot about noise. Noise is just not an irritant. The level of noise that the F-35 produces causes physical harm to human beings. Uh, and, and they actually talk about that in the EIS. One of the minds, they talk about noise, and they go through and they assess the noise on the on chickens and bears and coyotes and, and uh and they give a very small section on children. So that prompted us to go to the World Health Organization that they had actually referenced. And there was a treasure trove of information about the harmful effects, in, in particular on children. Because they are smaller, their organs are smaller, they cannot withstand the, the wave, you know, the, the frequencies of, the, of, this, of the noise produced. And it actually causes harm to their internal organs. Infants are really at risk as are the elderly and, and the ill and because they don't have the resistance you know, to, to fight off the detrimental effects of, of the noise. Um, so and you can go to our website, you know, ours is called Save Our Side for VT Vermont. Um, and you can see, we, we, um, when we designed our website, we, we took different categories. One was called uh, Cost for the Country. And that's economic. I mean, what taxpayers are paying for this wasteful weapon system? Technological disaster. You know, of, you know, all the flaws in this. And harm to children is another one. And and, and, and so if you can see those and maybe look at those for for maybe uh, ideas or or on, on how you might want to uh, challenge it. So that you were starting to talk about weapon loading and, and their armament. So they will be listed in the EIS. Uh, it will talk about the weapons that the F-35 can carry. Primarily, the F-35 is an, is an air-to-ground uh, weapon system. It is primarily an offensive weapon system. It has some air-to-air -air capability, but you know, people that have been looking at this say it is it is very poor. So, when if they use the thing that we needed to defend to defend Wisconsin, you know, like we've heard defend. Um, Vermont, it, you, you, have to, it, you come out saying it has no capability to defend Wisconsin because what is it going to defend against? So if you had incoming bombers, which you're not going to have because that, that era has passed by, but even if you did, it can't shoot them down. Your, your biggest threat is going to be from incoming missiles, particularly because the F-35A has been designated as part of our nuclear deterrence uh, strategy. It is now part of the triad that came out in the 2018 nuclear posture review that the, uh, the Pentagon released. That, that is now a nuclear weapon system. So you are now less safe or if it comes to your area than you are now because that automatically makes you a nuclear target. It is part, you know, up until the the 2018 nuclear posture review uh, came out. There were, only, there were only two aircraft that were carried nuclear weapons, the B-52 and the B-2. Now there were three, B-52, B-52, the B-2, and the F-35A, right? So those are the things you have to get out there and, and in front of it and say, we do not want to be a nuclear target. We do not want to have nuclear weapons, a uh, nuclear weapon delivery system. Uh, where the nuclear bombers, and they're called the, B, the B-61-12, that's the nuclear bomb that is being designed specifically for the F-35. You can find a lot of this on our website also. I'll give you another website that another organization I co-started with, uh, Ben Cohen, uh, called Citizens Against Nuclear Bombers in Vermont, right, dot org. It's C-A-N-B-B-T. New York. And you'll, you'll find all the information on the nuclear weapon systems, what the F-35 capability is. No F-35 has the capability right now, but it will in the future. That's what it's designed for. That's the plan <coughs> that the Pentagon has. And the weapon and the bomb that's being designed for is called the B-61-12. All of that you can find uh, on the website. Uh, but where the actual armament and the bomb is stored in material, uh, because they the platform is the target, not, not the, not the bond. The other armaments will be listed in the EIS, the conventional armaments. They'll talk about the JDAMs and the, uh, the, the, the various weapon systems. They'll list them. I will almost guarantee you they will not list the B-61-12, the nuclear bomb. Uh, almost positive. That will not be in there. That's why you've got to ask for it. You have to demand that 
that they tell you everything about every armament, including the nuclear weapon that the F-35 is designed to be capable of delivering. Where, uh, what the threats are for that, um, uh, where, it will, where everything will be stored, what the mission is of the, of the Madison Guard, uh, guard uh, so that you can decide whether you want to be part of a nuclear exchange, you know, or have your, your Vermont Air Guard carry that payload to some foreign uh, country. Because the, the, the really dangerous part about this is they're actually talking about using this. Uh, yes, this sir. administration is talking about using tactical nuclear weapons, um, which, you know, I, I used to do nuclear weapons planning, uh, targeting past the military. Um, so but this is not hypothetical. We're, it's sort of got off the rails with it. So, so from the armament, ask all those questions. Uh, every question you can possibly think of, put out there. The, you were talking about PFAS and, and the PFOAs and all that. So the other chemical contaminant that comes with the F-35 that you have never gotten with the F-16 is the chemical coating that makes it impervious, supposedly, impervious to radar, the stealth coating, right? So I have read, uh, and I, I don't have a lot of research on this, but I, I believe this is correct. Well, well, without a doubt, that coating is toxic. If, if that plane ever catches fire and that stuff starts burning, yeah, it, they've already demonstrated uh, that uh, that it can kill people because they kill people by burning um, the materials such as that. Uh, so, so there's a danger right there. So another question is, are we prepared to fight those kinds of fires? Um, and and uh, what does that mean when that plane, which is, I think it's 42% of military-grade composite materials, which are, which are flammable toxins and resins and glues that also give out um, toxic material, but then you have that chemical coating on top of it, which poses a, a, a danger to life if that ever should catch fire. But I, I have been told that after every flight, the plane has to be washed down and that chemical uh, stealth coating reapplied. Mm. Now, you're talking about contaminants now from the foam, I think that's what you're talking about, the firefighting foam, uh, as well as all of the other, uh, you know, uh, aircraft toxins that have leached into the water and into your ground soil, as it has been around many military bases. Well, this contaminant from this stealth coating just dramatically increases that. Ask that question. What are the implications? Wait, does that plane, when it is washed down, is there any chance of those chemical toxins getting into our water? All right. Give us guarantees that none of that will get in our water. I mean, they're going to say we're going to we're going to contain it. Yeah. Right. Just like they contained uh, other stuff. So ask how they're going to contain it. What are the guarantees? And what what happens if that does get into our water systems? So what are, what are the effects on the health and the, you know, of, of our, the people who drink that water or eat the food produced in the soil that is now contaminated from that? So, so these are some of the things you really need to bombard them with come out in force. And maybe you might scare them off. Uh, you know, no, no. Um, but all of this, if you are not successful and then they do end up choosing um, to act, then if you ever do decide to file a lawsuit, you'll have all of these things to bring on. One of the things, one of the reasons why I believe we were not successful is they didn't tell us these things. There wasn't in the EIS, so there was a, a catch-22. So we didn't, we didn't question it because we didn't know about it. We never knew about the nuclear weapons. We never knew about the whole issue of uh, military-grade composite materials. We didn't know about the toxic levels of the stealth coating. So when we tried to raise that in our lawsuit, the judge shut us down. Should have raised it during the comment period. Well, we didn't know about it. They didn't tell us about it. Well, not our fault. You know, that kind of stuff. So now you know. So uh, I'm just telling you, you know, uh, it doesn't take a lot. It only takes is one sentence. As long as you get one sentence in the record. So anyway, so that's... Um, 
Very helpful. Really good. Really good insight. Thank you so much um, for all those pointers as we um, enter this EIS process. Um, I guess, can you help us understand um, this F-35 sighting? Because in Burlington, you know, has F-35, are those the same type of F-35s that we are being considered for? And how many communities are, are in this same struggle with us? Um, and, and what is the difference? So the Air Force in Canada, I don't know if the numbers have shifted, it tends to produce something like 1,700 uh, F-35As. So they're going to have to find homes for all 1,700. So in Burlington, we happened to be the first place they went out to look. And they were looking for bases, uh, the military Air Force bases, and they were looking for guard bases, because they wanted to put them at both places. So when they did the initial look, they were looking at 205 air guard bases across the United States. So that's your competition. That's why I'm telling you, they made it appear to us that boy, if it didn't come here, you know, that the national defense needed a place for these and it didn't come to Burlington, my gosh, where would it go? Well, if you didn't pay attention, well, most people don't know all this stuff. There are there were 204 other places in the boat. It's not here or nowhere. It's here or just about anywhere. So they have intended, and I don't know if this has changed, that about every seven years or so, they were going to go out and do another scoping process to find other bases. They were going to do that, as I recall, 35 times, right, until they found the place for all of the F-35s. So I think maybe in the second round. I'm thinking you're in the second round, maybe you're the first round. But because of the delays and stuff, it's not on schedule. So they're going to keep doing this. So, so the good news is that, so you may be by half now. They might come back to mention it in the future, you know, if they if they still need places for the other five. So they would dearly love to go to places that are opening their arms to them. And, and, and so that's where they really want to go because they're not going to face the opposition. They're not going to run into lawsuits. People are just going to, you know, flag wave and come on. That's what the Air Force wants. That's why I'm trying to tell you, you know, if you make as much noise, they might just say, you know, well, you know, let's go to someplace else. And, and in Burlington, they almost did that. He said, our senator got involved and forced them to base it in Burlington. So the basing in Burlington was not done because it was the environment environmentally best place. In fact, they actually came out in the record of decisions and we were the worst place environmentally because we harmed in Burlington. We, the Air Force harmed up to 7,000 people in Burlington. That, that's who live in the noise zone, not incompatible with residential use. Whereas the other two bases we were in competition with had like, like one place like 123 people and the other one had something like 240 people and we had 7,000. So the Air Force, when they did that, they realized it, and we read all about this when we did our lawsuit because we read about it in, in, in their email exchanges. They realized we were, we were the worst place because we, they harmed so many people. They also found out along the way that we were operationally <laughs> in place. Um, uh, but our senator got involved and it became a political thing. So it wasn't, our selection was not based on their assessment, their environmental assessment. It was not based on what's good for the military and national defense. It was based on a political decision. Our senator wanted it here. That's Pat Leahy and, and Bernie Sanders. So they, in particular Leahy, forced the Air Force, we actually have transcripts of this, of him calling the four stars saying, regardless of all you've heard, I want it here. And so the Air Force actually they were going to select uh, McIntyre um, their guard base in South Carolina, and they ended up selecting Burlington. So ours was a political decision. If you can get your politicians on your side, they have the power, in particular your senators. They have authority over the military. They, we are a civilian-run military. Whatever senators want, senators get. If you can convince your senator or senators that this is not the state of Wisconsin, and we don't want it here, the Air Force will not base it there. Uh, I can guarantee you that. I 
of the Whitmer senators are in this. So we had two liberal um, senators here uh, who, for whatever reason, thought this was um, something that they wanted to bring to the state of Vermont. So that's pretty much why we have it for why two months from now we may be coming here. Well, we have one last thing we're going to do um, before then, which maybe you'll read about, them, you know. But um, we, we're going to keep going until the very end. Thank you so much um, for your work and for uh, sharing these resources for us. I think well, many of us were jotting down those websites you mentioned and we'll be checking those out um, as. I can send them to you. I can email to you if you don't get them. But the saveoursidebt.org and C A N V E T, Citizens Against Nuclear Bombers in Vermont, BT.org, are the two sites. Yeah. As of this point, I don't think that our senators have um, opposed this in any way and have even indicated support for the F-35 basing. So we have a lot of work to do there. They are on record, I believe, both of them supporting this, right? So that's not good for us. Um, uh, but early. It's so often you're going to run into is our senators came out supporting it before the EIS yeah. So they came out saying we want this before they learned what the impact is. Yeah. If you can get your senators to hold back on their full throated support for this, plead with them to wait until the impacts are on the side of the Air Force. Base your decision on information, <laughs> not on what you've been told or opinion. Because once they make a statement, most politicians are very reluctant say they made a mistake, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. the whole basic kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, it, it, if you can get to them now, so, it's leaving them not to make a decision based on what on your say or opinions, but wait till the facts come out. Yeah. If you get them not to come out, because, yeah. because then trying to get them to roll back, back is going to be Right. What to do if they're like most politicians? Well, have any senators in um, the United States came out on record opposing the siting in there? No, we say it because remember it has gone to any state. Yeah. No, none of them have. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, there have been a few cases where grassroots organizations and lawsuits did stop. Mm -hmm. Or cut back the effort. You can actually find that on our website. So we have the Florida, the Milwaukee, um, Virginia, uh, I, I even think Idaho, Alaska. So there are five or six states that actually uh, talk to the military to change their plans. Um, for the, in some cases, it was the F 35, in some cases, other weapons. In, in a few states, it was a senator. In, in Alaska, it was. I mean, uh, and that was, you know, what you get for um, it was an example of um, a senator has power over the Air Force. The Air Force wanted to put, I, I, I think it was the F-16, the they wanted to move it from one base to the other. That's what they wanted to do. And the senator came in and said, no, I don't want you to move it. Guess what? They didn't move it, right? And there are hundreds of cases you can go back and find that when a senator says something, the military invariably will go along with what the senator says because the senator holds the purse strings, yep. right? The senators are the ones that approve promotions. They often hold up promotions until they get what they want. So, um, so yeah, if you get your senators on your side, you're all great. Uh, you don't have to worry about the other stuff. All right, well, we have our work cut out for us, but you gave us a lot of good information, and I, I think we'll be able to maybe address some of these other questions that came to the front by looking in more detail at the websites about the particular types of lawsuits that have been filed. Um, and, and thank you so much. I, you, you really highlighted the importance of challenging and raising the issues of health impacts and um, the, the, these, the stealth uh, coding and these chemicals um, uh, that could be even more seriously contaminating um, our environment here, which I want to then get back to this um, 
PFAS issue, Tom, if you can um, talk to us a little bit about um, in more detail um, PFAS and um, the National Guard's um, failure to um, clean up um, the contamination surrounding the Truex Air Base. Um, what, are, what are we dealing with here? And what is the, the lay of the land in terms of protecting um, our water and um, making sure that we have clean water to drink? And the most vulnerable among us, including um, formula-fed infants and people with weakened immune systems, are protected from PFAS contamination. It's a big issue. <laughs> it's complicated. I just uh, hesitate because so easy to get down in the weeds here, but what's in the weeds is pretty important too. But um, what really amazes me about this is that we have this National Guard, which theoretically is here to protect protect the citizens, you know, supposedly protect them against war, but also protect them against floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and stuff like that. But they've been, you know, polluting Turexio and we have the largest uh, watershed in Madison right there. They use these two burn pits. Vets are well aware of what burn pits are. Uh, because there's been quite a few of them in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And they're beginning to call this something like uh, Agent Orange 2 or something like that. But they've been using these things since, well, the 50s or so, uh, doing the fire training since the 70s, burned a lot of other toxic chemicals in these burn pits. Um, and have, ne have never tested it. Uh, the, uh, so they're supposed to be protecting us, and instead we have every layer of government in Madison and Dane County is progressive. I have to put quotation marks around that. This progressive government, Tammy Baldwin, our former mayor, uh, our city council, our, our uh, county executive, who's nowhere to be seen on this issue, he won't talk to the press even. So all these people are supposedly concerned about the environment, concerned about a green economy, all that kind of nice stuff, you know? And to my way of looking at it, they've been spending all their time protecting the National Guard instead of protecting us. And they're all kind of uh, protecting each other, too. And these burn pits, uh, one thing that's interesting about them is they're not a, the county leases land to the air base. And uh, they have a lease, and we're looking into that uh, right now. There's a lot of questions about it. Um, but um, the area where the burn pits are it is not, it was not leased to the Nash Air National Guard. I was trying to explain this to somebody today and they had, had trouble understanding this. So the burn pits were used probably way before the Air National Guard. What I didn't understand is they had an Air Force, uh, Army, and Army National Guard here first. But anyway, they burnt a lot of nasty stuff there, and then when the 70s came along, and all these bases started to use the firefighting foam with the PFAS in it, um, that was not just used by the Air Force. I mean, the Air National Guard, it was used by the county fire departments, the city fire departments, and the MATC, and even volunteer fire departments. Now, Maria Powell went uh, looking around in January of this year and said that she saw at one of the burn pits 
Um, the other one is not being used anymore, but it was used for a long time. She saw city, city fire trucks using it. And as far as I know, MAPC is still using it. So all these levels of government are implicated and responsible for this pollution. <laughs> and the counties, you know, basically Joe Parisi, as far as I can tell, has been hiding under his desk since the Wisconsin State Journal started reporting in this in December of this year. And I think somebody should go and knock on the top of his desk and find out where the hell he is. <laughs> He's supposed to be this progressive politician who concerns concerned about the environment. And they're very, very implicated in this. They own the land, they've been leasing it to them. And what's ironic now is, okay, the Air National Guard and the Air Force with the $716 billion budget this year, and these planes that cost $100 million a piece, they say they can't clean up this mess that they've been making for decades and decades. So the county and the city and the DNR and all that have already said, okay, you can't afford it, so we'll let you do it when you get around to it. And since there's something like uh, 121 of these bases around the country that are polluted, and most of them much worse than ours, we're way, way low on the list. So by the time they get around to it, it's probably gonna be 20, 30 years down the road, would be my suspicion. Uh, so the strange thing is, these uh, burn pits this past year, uh, after this all happened, you know, the, the DNR did try to go after them at first. Then there was this secret meeting somewhere between maybe mid-June and mid-July last year, this backroom meeting, and all of a sudden, the DNR was not going after the Air National Guard anymore. They reached this memorandum of understanding with them. And the suspicion is, that, well, you know, when the well was shut down this past March, it was shut down probably because our illustrious mayor who was running again to become mayor for life or whatever, uh, probably put a lot of pressure on the DNR and all kinds of other agencies in the city and the county. So they came up with this memorandum of understanding. But what's really strange now is that these burn pits that were not on the Air National Guard land that they were leasing, the counties, the, the Air National Guard came to the county and said, we'll take responsibility for these burn pits. Well, they've already said they won't take responsibility, they can't afford it for the base itself, for the water that's flowing into Starkweather Creek and ultimately Lake Monona, you know. And yet they're taking responsibility now to do nothing with these burn pits which weren't even on their land. So, so I'm just gonna jump in here because yeah. we, um, you know, time wise when you're just engaged in such an interesting panel, and I want to get to um, a couple other panelists here because um, you know Alder Marsha Rommel um, from Progressive Dane has um, uh, been a sponsor of a resolution to create a city and county task force on the issue of PFAS, which is a small step, but an important step for public and transparent engagement on this issue. Um, Alder uh, Tag Evers, what is the status, can you, well, can you talk a little bit about that resolution and the task force and then kind of where it's at in the committee process? Because I'm grateful that at least there's some local elected officials like, I am concerned with this issue and think that if you know the feds aren't going to step up, we here have a duty to, to protect folks and investigate and figure out what's going on and what we can do about it. You know, I was talking with Marsha before this, uh, before I came here, I've got to get an update specifically about the status of the resolution. I know that it's close to being completed and, and ready to bring to council. Uh, it came up during uh, the CCEC Common Council Executive Committee as something that we really felt was necessary when the water utility uh, representative came and spoke 
we felt like we needed to push back and not just trust city and county staff for public health to be able to resolve this issue because it felt very incomplete. By the way, um, it's an open question as to whether the, the firefighting phone that was used this Friday, past Friday, at the big fire that happened at the two substations included PFAS, and we haven't heard so far as to whether or not it did, but they're treating it as a hazardous waste site, so most likely it did. I do think it's important. Um, we have a mayor now who is in, endorsed by Progressive Dane and by the Green Party, and I think it's reasonable to ask Mayor Sajid to take a strong stand on this. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, what we've learned from Roseanne and the importance of elected officials and community members to be informed and to push back and to ask the right questions. We live in a city that uh, determined that climate change is a serious threat. So we came up with this resolution to, uh, to by the year 2030, that we were gonna move to 100% renewables and net zero carbon emissions. We consider this an emergency. Well, unless we don't really care about the environment apart from climate change, this is an issue that should demand our attention. And elected officials are hypocrites if they say yes to F-35s, but no to climate change. Because the F-35s, the implication, the health effects, the health impact, and the moral complicity with nuclear war and, and, and the military is an issue that's every bit as important as our concerns about climate change. It's more immediate in some respects. Thank you, Ted. And before I forget, I want to let folks know that there is a website, and that is uh, Dane in Environment Dane. dot com, and that is a way you can. Um, endorse the, the city county task force resolution and send um, a petition uh, your communication to your city all of you if you live in the city of madison to support this resolution and help give it a push and the support that it needs to finish um, and get uh, adopted by the madison common council it's also a place where you can add your feedback to the resolution do you think there's something missing is there improvements that could be made to the resolution what do you want to see that task force do is um environmentdane.com. Thanks, Alice, um, for working on that with us. And that's another place where you can go hopefully get updates and other ways to connect with um, different levels of government on um, PFAS and um, the issue that she asked. Now, um, we've been talking a lot about the city of Madison from the city alder. John, how can we connect um, rural and farm voices to this city, um, the Madison debate that we're having. Yeah, so I mean, I, I should share that you know, I first heard about the problem with the trash back in 1995. Some of you might remember the Amish sent an unprecedented petition to the governor, over 500 of them signed this, and they were really concerned about the low level order flights like S 16s that were happening in the Kickapoo Roqua area. People were having accidents with their buggies, animals were spontaneously aborting their babies. And um, and I remember this because I had just come to UWS as a graduate student of college agriculture, and I was just getting involved with family farm defenders. And you know, this is not just, I mean, I live with this stuff taking off over my house all the time, but you can imagine being in rural parts of the state, these planes are going to be flying out the full field, they're going to be flying all over the place, they're already out doing the F 16s. The impact goes way beyond just Madison. And um, as far as PFAS, I mean, the contamination, we talked to farmers in other parts of the country, there's over 190 some PFAS contamination sites. These include dairy farms, whose waters are contaminated in Texas. Uh, you know, I've heard all sorts of other problems in other parts of the country. So, yeah, so I mean, this is not, you know, just a Madison problem. And so I think. Um, we need to think about, you know, do we want, I mean, I guess as, you know, someone looking at the broader picture, do we want to continue to go down this path of embedding our economy and our community into the military industrial context, which is just not sustainable? And, I mean, there's so many, I mean, where is the piece of it? We need to have a just transition to a post-nuclear, I would say post-carbon society. And how do we do that? And, you know, I, I'm, 
person really frustrated when they have some politicians here who just roll over and are just happy to take money being thrown at them. But I mean, just think of the opportunity cost. If you had this, if this amount of money is available, if you put this into, say, transition to a green economy, supporting sustainable agriculture, how could you convert Oscar Meyer into an agro, you know, some sort of different, you know, entrepreneurial site for a small scale farmer. I mean, I, I think lots of better ways to be spending that money. And so when you think about how do we critique this, don't be, I mean, the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce spent over $100,000 lobbying to get this F-35 to come here. They, they've admitted that. We need to be pushing back and saying, this is our taxpayer money. It could be used other ways. So when we want to critique that economy, the opportunity cost, we are spending money on this rather than other things. That's not free money. That's money we decided to allocate here and not there. That's cost number one, opportunity cost. Cost number two, we've already heard about this, transaction costs. What are the liabilities? What are the lawsuits? That's all like after we made a decision to do this, we huge all sorts of other costs involved. And then we talked about costs that we aren't even able to put into numbers yet. Like Negative externalities. What is the cost of the air, the noise, the pollution, you know, uh, uh, effects on infants and children, the elderly, um, property values, and these are all things that economics we would try to put numbers on. We may not be able to do that, but we have a process of doing that kind of analysis. But we need to be addressing all those. I mean, they're, they're giving us the benefits. I would say the benefits are really minimal. Just look like at multiplier effects for military spending. Bad. Military spending has really poor economic impacts on your community compared to, say, healthcare spending or even disaster relief spending. I can think lots of other ways. Education. Really, education spending where you can really boost our economy here much more than, say, throwing more money at a nuclear F 35. My brother was in the Air Force, too. He worked on the B 2. <coughs> All the Dakotas and the stealth tech, yeah, I mean, all the problems with this technology is just, it's a dead end, waste of money, in my opinion. And, and as you've already heard, this is offensive. This is not a defensive technology at all. I wish we were Switzerland. I wish we were Costa Rica. I wish we were not investing in this type of technology anymore. It's a total waste of our money and capital. And um, I'm, I'm so thrilled that we've heard some excellent, the Vermont example is really heartening. But these are things we need to raise and bring up. I think we need to challenge our public officials like, to come out and say, prove to us that this is worth it to our community. Or is this making our community worse? I would argue it's making our community much, much worse in some ways. So, Roseanne, um, how do we think about that? Because I went to one of those sessions, one of those listening sessions, and there were a lot of people there from the, um, the Air National Guard, or what is it, 15 fire <coughs> And, you know, they were basically like, this is our livelihood. This is, you know, you had mentioned the base would have to shut down. I mean, are there alternative peaceful visions for military mm -hmm. bases, post-carbon, post-nuclear, the type of things that John was talking about? Yes, and so this is one of the things that I would suggest you raise right up front, is to cut them off when they come up with the heated to keep jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or the air car flying or the airport or whatever they, they throw at you. And that is, this F-35 is not the only mission for the Wisconsin air car. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of other missions. In fact, the Air Force for years has been trying to get guard units to take up cyber security mission. And, and the reason is that's our greatest threat right now. Absolutely. We do not have a threat from the incoming bomber anymore or fire attack. <laughs> that is, that is, we're, we're still, that M35 was prepared for an environment in a world that no longer exists. There are no dogfights occurring anymore. We're out. But what our real threat now, and when the F-35 had absolutely no capability, to help us with is cyber security and terrorism. So there are many, many missions that <coughs> air guard and any air guard can take up. They will make it appear as it is the air the F-35 or we're closing it up. Absolutely not. 
time period, um, as well as Dan stated, 60 days, that's not much time. That does not give us much time, so we're going to have to be ready to go. But um, we were really lucky and fortunate to have and learn so much from your effort in Vermont. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties, but I'm so glad we were able to get you back and thank you for our very so much.